Good morning, everybody. Morning. If you could uh, open your Bible to yeah. Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. Now, we did have a great trip to Los Angeles, and it was awesome to see uh, the disciples who graduated um, from ICCM. That was really encouraging. Charmaine and I will actually very soon, uh, God willing, be starting our master's program for the ICCM. And uh, so that's awesome. I actually just finished my Spanish over the summer. So I have, I now have one year of Spanish under my belt, and uh, hola, muy bien, gracias, y tú. Okay. Proverbs chapter 20. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 20, verse 4. It says, uh, Sluggards do not plow in season, so at harvest time they look but find nothing. We'll stop right there. Now, uh, this is a great proverb. I was doing some Bible study and I was just wondering hey, what do we need to focus on? Right? What do I need to focus on? What does the Boston church need to focus on? And I think it's fair to say that we need to baptize some more people, yeah. right? I mean, let's just say it like it is, right? We need to go and we need to have a harvest for the church. Come on. So I saw this passage like, wow, so this is what it's about, right? If you want to have a harvest, then you have to do some plowing. Right. And so I was looking up the definitions of these words. And uh, really, the word plow is an interesting word. It basically just means to literally turn up the earth, Right. And so for most of mankind, they would plow with a tool called a plowshare. And that literally means that they would go inch by inch through the ground and they would use this tool to dig up the earth and then turn it up, right? Turn it up. And you have to get through the rocks. I mean, you have to get through the grass, the plants, the roots that are in the soil, all those things. You're trying to make the soil soft enough that you can plant a seed in it. Now, after all that hard work, you'd have calloused hands. Your hands would be bleeding. I mean, it was really hard labor, labor that most of us have never experienced and will never experience in our life. You know what I mean? But that's what they had to do. And all that work, that was just to plant the seeds. They still didn't even know if the soil was any good. And then they had to wait for the, wait for the rain just to see if those seeds would grow in that soil. Isn't that crazy? And if it didn't work out, then they were really struggling. There was a famine, and then they would have to go somewhere else and find some other ground to plow and plant some seeds. Wow. And so it's a really hard work. And so that's why it says, sluggards do not do this, right? Wow. The word sluggard, I looked that word up. It's great. It basically just means a, a lazy, sluggish person. Wow. And so that's what that means. It means a person who is unwilling to work or use their energy. A person who is slow moving or inactive, lacking energy or alertness, slow to respond to make progress. That's what that word means. And so the Bible is just telling us straight up, look, if you want to have a harvest, you can't be a sluggard. Now, I've got a dad joke for you. Uh, have you ever heard the story of the slug and the two turtles? No. Okay, well, let me tell you the story. So there is a slug. Slug is root for sluggish. You know what I'm talking about? Sluggard right there. So slug. So a slug is uh, walking down the street, slugs walk, and uh, it's walking down the street, and it's very slow, but it's going down the street, and it gets jumped by two turtles, and so these two turtles come, they beat up the slug, they take his slug wallet, and his slug money, and all his slug valuables, and then they leave him there, and then they take off. And the slug calls the slug authorities, and uh, the authorities come, and they say, hey, what happened? Tell us what happened. Um, you know, can you describe what these, you know, two turtles look like? And the slug says, you know, honestly, I can't. It all happened too fast. <laughs> There's your uh, dad joke for the day. So that's what it means to be a slug, right? I mean, you're, you're, when you're a slug, you're so slow moving that even the turtles are moving too fast for you right there. And that's what it means to be lazy. You know... Really, I think uh, just as the evangelist of the Boston Church, what's been on my heart is that I really want to just turn the church in into a new era. You guys oh, with me here? Amen. I mean, it's been we've been oh, here for about a year, a little bit over a year, me and Charmaine. And over the past year, I'd say there's been some significant challenges. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, it is what it is. Really, God's been pruning the church. There was some fallaways before we got here. There's been a number of fallaways since we've got here. And God has been pruning the church so that we can have a solid group of sold-out disciples. And I look out, and I'm like, man, I would take this group of 50 sold-out disciples any day. 
Like, we can go anywhere in the world and crank. Come on. Like, we can crank. I mean, you take a group like this that all loves God with all their heart, and they want to be disciples, and they're fired up, and they will turn a city upside down. Come on. Now, the cool thing is, is that we're already in the city that we're supposed to turn upside down. So we don't actually have to go anywhere. We don't have to move. You can just do it right now. But I think we just got to get the energy. You with me? We, we got to turn the corner. We got to get the energy and get the motivation to go out there and do it. Come on. And that's really what's going to take to turn the corner. You go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 62. Come on. And this is going to be our, our key passage here for the sermon. It says, Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, I think this is very important. I was having a great conversation with, uh, with a brother, and uh, we were just talking, and you know, uh, he was you know, asking me, like, oh, he's like, when are we going to turn the corner? And he had mentioned some things that had happened recently and some things from the past and things like that. And I said, you know what, bro? You, you made me think of a scripture. And we went to this passage. And really, what is Jesus trying to say here? He's saying, look, if you want to change things, if you want to turn a city upside down, if you want to take a group where, let's say, a city of 600,000 people like Boston, where there's not many disciples, there's only about 50, and you want to change that city, then here's what you got to do. You got to start plowing. Come on. And if you're going to plow, you can't look back, right? In other words, you got to put your hand in the plow, and you got to start turning up the soil on the earth, and you can't even think about what happened yesterday. Because you can't plow if you're looking at yesterday. You only have to look at where you want to go tomorrow. I said, that's what it is. That's how we're going to turn the corner. To take 50 disciples and then go and preach to a city of 600,000, you got to go forward. You can't look backwards. Amen. And you got to glue your hands to the plow and start getting them a little bit dirty so that you can change the city. You guys with me here? Yeah. The title of the sermon is Hand to the Plow. Point number one is plowing in prayer. 1 Kings chapter 18. Now, everything that we do as disciples needs to be motivated really by our love for God. Amen. And God actually makes it so that we can't accomplish anything really uh, of any eternal consequence without a relationship with him. And that's actually just the way he sets things up. And so over and over again, if you study out the powerful men of the Bible, these men were powerful not just because they were able to work hard, but because they had a cranking and faithful relationship with God. Yeah. And these men were prayer warriors. And so really what I want to do is take a look at just two prayer warriors in the Bible. And I was going through, I was like, man, there's so many awesome scriptures I could share. So I just had to narrow it down. And I decided to look at two men in particular. The first one is Elijah. First Kings chapter 18, verse 41. Now, the context here is that three and a half years prior, Elijah had actually prayed because God commanded him to that there would be no rain yeah. because God wanted to bring a famine. Why? Because there was Baal worship. There was worship of false gods. And so God wanted to shake up the countryside. And so what do you do? Well, you stop bringing the rain. Now they're plowing, but there's no harvest. Mm, wow. And so they're desperate. Yeah. But instead of going to God, they go to Baal. And so then God sends Elijah and he says, Elijah, you need to preach. And then he preaches and then the fire comes down and then he actually slaughters the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah in the valley before all the people and they recommit themselves to Jehovah God. Come on, Elijah. Come on. But right after he does that, we're picking it up here in verse 41. And Elijah said to Ahab, go eat and drink for there is the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Wow. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant, and he went up and looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. Wow. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rains stop you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose, the heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. We'll stop right there. Pretty powerful guy right here. I mean, he just slaughters all the false prophets. Now he's running faster than the horse and chariots to Jezreel. And he's a he's power, powerful man of God right here. 
He stopped the rain, three and a half years of famine. The famine is so bad, it's, dry, it's drying up the brooks of the Jordan River. Wow. Elijah, up to this point, had been fed by ravens and then by the widow at Zarephath, where God was just multiplying the, the flour that she had so that she wouldn't die, but she was giving to the prophet of God. But he goes and he accomplishes God's will, and then he gets down, face between his knees, and he prays. Come on. And before he even prays, he tells Ahab, get ready because the rain is coming. Wow. And so he prayed with faith. He knew the rain was going to come, even though there was no sign of it yet. He said, I can actually hear it. I can hear the rain. It's about to come. He goes and he prays, hands between his knees, still no clouds. Seven times he cries out to God. And then there's only one tiny little cloud. One baptism. (laughs) Two baptisms. But then he says, go tell the king that it's about to pour. And he runs to Jezreel. The clouds darken and there's torrential rains on the land and things start to change. You know, really, if you want to be a powerful man or woman of God, it comes down to our prayer life. It starts with our prayer life. There will be hard work, but it starts with our prayer life. And as a disciple of Jesus, I got to say, there are very few things that are more inspiring than when you know a disciple is crying out to God and then God answers that prayer. Yeah. I mean, isn't that super inspiring when you see that? Yeah. One brother I wanna, wanna, really want to lift up is our brother Julius. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, you know, I'll be real. Julius has been going through a lot. Right. Go talk to Julius and he'll tell you all the things that he's been going through. Right. And he's been going through a tough time and he's trying to move to Boston. He's been in Worcester. There's a famine in the land. And we're trying to pull him in. And we're trying to get him close to the body of Christ here. But he's been going through some hard times, and he's been crying out to God. And we were talking on the phone uh, actually yesterday, and I think the day before as well. And uh, he was just telling me some things, and uh, you know, I was talking to him about some things. And one thing that Julius loves to do, and you know this, if you know Julius, he loves to give money to the church. And he really does believe in his heart that one of his callings is to make a lot of money and then just go, whoop. There you go. That's for the church. Amen. And that's what he does. Julius just goes, wow, <laughs> he just, it comes in and it goes out and it goes to the church. And he tries to help us so that we can fund God's mission in the Northeast. Come on. And, you know, times have been tough. And he was praying to God. He's like, God, if I'm going to keep giving money to the church, you got to keep giving me money. Right? You got to keep sending me the money so that I can keep giving the money. Right. And we get off the phone and he, you know, gives a significant amount of money to the church. And, and then he prays and he walks to go get the mail. And he opens up the mail, and in the mail is a check for $6,000. Wow! They didn't even know it was coming. And this is just Julius's relationship with God. He's faithful, he prays, and then God gives him money, and then Julius gives it to the church. And he helps us to have, uh, you know, some awesome places to meet and some people on staff. So that we can work hard for the Lord. There's a, a couple in, um, in Brooklyn, New York, that I, I love telling their story because they have some great prayer victories as well. Yeah, and uh, it's Mario and Kayla Mendiha from the Brooklyn region of New York City. And there was one missions where he decided to pray because he didn't know how he was going to make his missions goal. And he's just praying. And he's like, God, I just help me to make my missions. I don't know what I'm going to do. And he's praying through his heart and his fears. He's like, okay, God, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give my rent check to missions. Wow. Wow. Now, I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent. But I'm just going to be faithful that if I give this to missions, you're going to provide for us. Come on. Come on. Jesus name. Amen. <laughs> Five minutes later, Kayla's aunt calls Mario and she sends uh, them a check as a wedding gift. Their wedding was five years earlier. <laughs> and it's a check for two thousand wow. dollars. And God answered the prayer in five minutes. Because he got down on his knees and he prayed, he got some faith, he made a decision to be radical for God, and then God came through. And that's how it worked. They also had been living with uh, Mario's parents for quite some time, and they wanted to move to Brooklyn, really be part of the region, be in the region, and have their own place to live so they could have their own family. And they're praying they couldn't really afford, you know, the, li- the cost of living in Brooklyn, and it's the highest in the country, pretty much, with yeah. the lowest, uh, you know, job, uh, paying jobs in the country, too. So yeah. it's a bad combo right there. And so he's praying, he's like, God, help me. If we're going to move to Brooklyn, I need to be within walking distance of the subway, like right next door. And uh, because, you know, he doesn't want to walk that far. He's like, I got to be right next to the subway. And we can only really afford about twelve hundred dollars a month. Now, this apartment is a two bedroom, right? That's what they're praying for. Now, this apartment doesn't exist. Okay, I'll just help you out here. That doesn't exist in Brooklyn. 
But he prays for it. He starts to fast for it. He gets desperate. He fasts for it. Three days later, through word of mouth, not even finding it online, he basically, friend of the family says, hey, you can come live in this two-bedroom apartment. It's right next to the train, and it's only going to be $12.50 a month. God totally comes through and answers the prayer, and they move into their apartment in Brooklyn, New York. Now, I remember when Christian and Tony were moving to New Hampshire, I'd given them the charge to live close to UNH. And I said, you guys got to move to New Hampshire. You got to get an apartment right next to the University of New Hampshire so that we can really be close to where we're evangelizing. And so they go there and I find out, you know, like a month later, they're looking at apartments like 45 minutes away uh, from UNH. And I'm like, no, (laughs) go back to UNH and find an apartment in in that area. And they're like, oh, we looked and we couldn't find anything. And so, so I told them a story of Mario and Kayla. And I said, well, why don't you fast? Why don't you pray? Wow. Pray for God to just give you the apartment wow. according to what you can actually afford, right? And so they start fasting and they decide to imitate the faith of Mario and Kayla. And three days later, they find an apartment right next to UNH. Yeah. The exact amount of money they prayed for. And now they live right next to campus. Come on. And Christian has a job on campus Woo-hoo. working at the university. I mean, this is the power of prayer. When you're faithful and you get down on your knees and you put it before God and it's in God's will, then God answers the prayer. But this is where it starts. Go to James chapter 5. Come on, Come on Aaron. Love it. James chapter 5, verse 15. Come on. James chapter 5, verse 15. And here, you know, we know this passage... Um, more specifically for verse 16, but I want to read a little before and a little after. It says in James chapter 5, verse 15, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. So pray for me and my family. We're all sick right now. (laughs) The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed spiritually. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Come on. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the air of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. We'll wow. stop right there. Wow. You know, this passage talks about a few things. It talks about being sick. It talks about confessing. And that's usually what we read is verse 16. It also talks about saving souls. But really, the entire context of the passage is prayer. And that's really what it's talking about. And so you see there's some results that we're always looking for in here. Healing, repentance, salvation. But the cause of all of it is your prayer life. How is your prayer life? Good question, bro. And the only difference between a disciple who isn't powerful, not like Elijah, and a disciple who is powerful, like Elijah, is that Elijah prayed. Amen. And he was righteous. Come on, man. And the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Come on. Come on. And so that's what it's all about. We need to be righteous, and then we need to ask God. And then if it's in the will of God, God will answer the prayer. And it really is not more complicated than that. Yeah. It's not magic, but it's not rocket science either. Wow. Yeah. It's just the formula that God gave us so that we will have a relationship with him. You know, it talks about fallaways in this passage. If you want to help fallaways, what do you got to do? Well, you got to preach the word to them. Come on. But before you preach the word to them, you got to get some faith and you got to pray for them. Come on, come on. And you got to pray for them and then you preach the word for them. To them, and if that can help them, they're going to turn back, and now you've saved them from death. How do you help your coworkers, your friends, your family, the people that you go to school with, the people that you really desire in your heart to go to heaven? Well, you got to get some faith. You got to preach the word to them. But before that, you got to pray for them. And if you're not down on your knees and you're not praying for them one time, two times, three times, four times, five times, six times, Elijah, seven times then how are you going to impact that person's life? You're not bringing God into it to help that person to repent of their sin. And this is what it's all about. It's really not magic. It's discipleship. It's faith and it's prayer. 
If our will is in line with God's will, why would God not answer our prayers? Wow. Prayers. But what is God's will? God's will is for people to be saved. Yeah. And so we pray for the wrong things sometimes. Wow. We're praying for ourselves. We need to pray for people to be saved. Yeah. And we need to pray every day for it. Because it's not going to happen in one day. You don't evangelize a city like Boston in a day. Because you can't share your faith with 600,000 people in a day. Right. But you pray for them every day. Come on. And then you go out with faith Come on. and you share it. Awesome. Come Exodus on. chapter 9. Come on, bro. Come on. Come on. Exodus chapter 9, verse 27. Come on, babe. Now, the first one we looked at there was Elijah. The second man I want to look at here is Moses. Come on. Oh. Exodus 9, verse 27. Now, we've actually read through the book of Exodus. We did a whole series on it for the church. Now, when you're doing a series, it's hard to talk about everything. So what I'm doing here is I'm just going to zero in on very specific passages and talk about prayer. Okay. Exodus Come chapter on. 7, verse 29. Moses replied, when I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands in prayer to the Lord. And so over and over again, if you study out Moses, this is how he would pray. He would actually lift his hands up to God. Not everybody prays exactly the same way, right? Elijah, he was down on the ground, his, hands, his head between his knees. Moses would go like this. And so before the Red Sea, you know, raised his hands. Uh, all throughout the Bible, when he calls out to God, he lifts his hands up. That's awesome. So he says, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, verse 28. Verse 27. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. This time I have sinned, he said to them. The Lord is in the right, and my people are in the wrong. Pray to the Lord, for we have had enough thunder and hail. I will let you go. You don't have to stay any longer. Verse 29. Moses replied, when I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands in prayer to the Lord. Verse 33. Then Moses left Pharaoh and went out of the city. He spread out his hands toward the Lord. The thunder and hail stopped, and the rain no longer poured down on the land. We'll stop right there. And so here, it's easy to miss when you study out Exodus it's easy just to look at all the miracles, right? So you know that there was the plagues. The plagues led to the people being set free. That led to literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Israelites being freed from slavery, crossing the Red Sea. That was the miracle of the Red Sea. And then God feeds them with the manna. And then eventually they're in the promised land. You see all these different results. But it's very easy to miss the catalyst to all of those results. Wow. And the catalyst is the prayer. Wow. That's the catalyst. Before all these major miracles, Moses was, would lift up his hands and he would cry out to God. Now, he was actually, all he was doing was what God commanded him to do, yeah. right? So when the plagues came and when the plagues stopped, this was all part of God's plan. Moses knew already in advance what God was going to do, but he was still in prayer calling on God to do it. He wasn't praying for his own agenda. He was following God's agenda, but God was working through Moses and that is the nature of a relationship with God. So God makes his will clear to us through the Bible and then we engage in obeying it, but we also stay with God as we obey it to be the catalyst in our prayer life for the miracles to happen. Why? Because if the miracles happen for you, Without praying to God, well, then you think you can have a life without God and be powerful. And God doesn't want you to have that. God wants you to have a relationship with him. That's what it's about. Exodus chapter 17, verse 8. Now it goes on and they crossed the Red Sea and they'd had some struggles. And eventually they even have some enemies that confront them. And in Exodus chapter 17, verse 8, we'll pick it up here. It says, The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I'll stand up on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, prayed, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. Wow. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. We'll stop right wow. there. Now, what does okay. God want for us? He wants, to over, he wants us to overcome the enemy, Satan, with the sword, the Bible, by freeing people of their sins so that they can be baptized as disciples and be saved. Come on. That is the Great Commission. Mm-hmm. 
That is, that is literally what we're doing. And that is how we conquer the promised land spiritually through the new covenant in our relationship with Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean it's easy, right? It's a battle. Satan doesn't just hand souls to you. And you remember because you remember the battle that happened for your soul. And you know the battle that's still being waged for your soul right now. So, of course, it's not easy. It is an actual battle. And you do have to take out your sword. Amen. But what actually brings the victory in the battle? Prayer. Come on. In fact, it is going to be hard no matter what. But without prayer, it's impossible. They had no victory when Moses didn't have his hands up. When his hands came down, they were being defeated. When his hands were up and he was praying, they were victorious. So what's the key? It's always hard, but the only way to win is keep your hands up. The only way to have victories in the Lord is to stay constant in prayer. This is what it means. When you say things like prayer warrior, that's what we're talking about. Disciples who are committed to a prayer life where they're going to be close to God every day no matter what, but they're faithful that God will answer their prayers as long as they're praying in the will of God, and their purpose is to save souls. And God will always work powerfully through a disciple like that. In the campus ministry, we're getting radical. We're getting radical. I mean, the campus ministry thought it was radical last year. It was not radical. And, uh, and I'm the campus minister, so it's my fault. That means I wasn't radical. Oh, yeah, that's what that means. Amen. Well, now we're going to get radical. But you can't be radical if you're not in prayer. That's right. And so we started with an all-night prayer. And me and Charmaine, we went to L.A. We came back Wednesday, and then we had our all-night prayer Friday. The entire family is sick. Me and Charmaine still did our all-night prayer. And I'm fired up we did our all-night prayer. And I am delirious right now, but I don't care. Because I can take DayQuil and be fine. Come on. And that's what I did. Although this morning, or last night I took NyQuil and I slept through my alarms. And then I woke up, you know, after my alarms and had a heart attack this morning. Because uh, I thought I was going to be late for church. But I made it to church. Praise God. Amen. But... You got to be in prayer. And we had our all night prayer. And we had to get down on our knees. And when we were tired, we had to get up and put our hands up. Right. And we had to pray. And say, we're going to go after the campus ministry this Come year. On. But we can't be victorious unless we rely on God. Yeah. And that's what it's about. And so it's time to start plowing. Yeah. It's time to start Come plowing. On. The only way to move forward is to plow. And your hands have to go to the plow and they can't leave. And you can't even turn your head. You can't even look back. And it starts with plowing in prayer. And so what are you praying for? Are you praying in God's will? Are you praying to baptize somebody before the end of the year? How hard are you praying for it? Are you willing to pray for it seven times? Pouring your heart out to God, crying out to God to see the miracles happen. Point number two, plowing for people. Hosea chapter six. Hosea chapter 6, verse 4, and uh, we're, this is a minor prophet, and there's 12 minor prophets here before we start the New Testament. I was thinking about doing a sermon series on the minor prophets, but I've had many ideas for sermon series, so I don't know what's actually going to happen. Uh, but here, Hosea chapter 6, it's a, a great little uh, book. It's basically about being faithful to God, yeah. and, uh, and it's very powerful, the example of the prophet Hosea. Yeah. But there's a couple passages in this book that I've always thought were, were very inspiring, and I'll, and I'll share a couple of them with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first one here is in Hosea chapter 6. Come on. And uh, if you're trying to find Hosea, it's before Matthew. <laughs> uh, I have passed it three times at this point. Come on. Come on. <laughs> and now I'm going page by page. After Daniel. After Daniel. Right after Daniel. Okay. <laughs> Hosea chapter 6. Hosea 6, verse 4. It says, what can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Therefore, I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. Then my judgments go forth like the sun, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. We'll stop right there. You know, here it's all about faithfulness to God. But at the core of being faithful to God and God's mission is love. That's the core of everything, Matthew 22, 34 through 40. That's the greatest commandment. Love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so if you love God, then you're compelled to follow God. You're not going to live life for yourself. You're going to live life for Jesus because you love Jesus. And that's really what the Bible preaches. 
But here, the rebuke against Ephraim and Judah specifically is that they have a love that doesn't last. And so it says your love is like the morning mist. In other words, it's there for a short time, but once the dawn comes, it disappears. Mm -hmm. And so God says, what can I do with you? What can I do with a disciple who doesn't have a love that lasts until the next day? What can I do with a disciple like that? A disciple that doesn't love me every day. A disciple that doesn't love the lost. How can I use a disciple like that? I can't. I need disciples who love me, that have an unfailing love, that they love God and they love the lost more than they love themselves. And so when they wake up in the morning, they have a purpose in their life that fuels them for that day to actually go make an impact, to obey God and to help the people that are around them in their life. And that's what it's about. And that's why we have the word of God. And that's why we have preaching, right? And that fires me up too, right? Like we're cut to pieces by the word. And you have a quiet time because you're selfish in the morning. And then you read your Bible. And you're like, oh, I got to repent. I can't be selfish. And then you, you do repent. And repentance doesn't take long. Some people will tell you it does. It actually doesn't. It takes a day. You read it. You fall in love with God. You love people more than yourself. And you repent. And then you go... And you do something about it. And it's not about the religious ceremonies. It's about the love. The love that compels us to obey God and to save the lost. And that's what it's about. If you want to bring the rain, you have to have a love that doesn't disappear like a mist. A mist can't water dried up land. Only a rain can. And it's got to keep pouring. You got to keep the the rain pouring. That's the love in your life. Matthew chapter 9. Now, Jesus, he lived this life. That's why he's awesome. Jesus did it perfectly. Jesus loved God with all his heart, and he loved people with all of his heart. And so he gives us an example, and this is one of the best passages in the Bible that show us the example that Jesus gave us. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages. Why all of them? Because he loves everybody, and he wants everybody to be saved teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So Jesus, he lives this life. He's an example for us. And he says, I want everybody to be saved. I want the 600,000 citizens of Boston, Massachusetts to be saved. I want everybody in New Hampshire to be saved. So what do we have to do? We have to share our faith with at least 600,000 people. Wow. Why? Because he had compassion on the people. He knew they were in pain. He knew they were suffering. He could see it. He knew there was open people. And he wanted to find them. But the only way to find them was to go share his faith with them. And so that's what he did. He worked hard. His hand was to the plow. And he was plowing for people. And that's what it's about. And, you know, a lot of times we look around, we say, people don't need God. I mean, look, they look happy. They're fired up. I just read an article Charmaine found on the Internet about a girl, a student at BU, Boston University, popular student. She was a leader. She was a leader in different organizations. She had an impact on campus. People knew her. She was friends with a lot of people. She was always happy. Great relationship with her mom. She had a brother. They went on vacation. They came back from vacation. The mom kills her kills the, her brother and kills herself and everybody is shocked they don't know how it happened because they said they were always happy they had a great family and literally even up the week before that this happened they were posting on facebook about how much they loved each other and how awesome things were and the community is stunned they have no idea why this happened and they can't figure it out well i'll tell you why because people are hurting and it doesn't matter how happy they look. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You remember your life when you didn't have God. Yeah. And when there's something missing, eventually it's going to kill you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's Satan. He's coming for you. Yeah. And it's coming for the lost. But Jesus sees it. He's not deceived. And so he works hard to do something yeah. about it. Yeah. We got to save people at BU. That's why we got to share with 10,000 people Come on, bro. this semester. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we got to share with at least 18,000 before the end of the year yeah. at BU. Because we need to find the people that want to have a relationship with God before it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus can see them. Now, Jesus here, it did start with prayer for Jesus too, right? It actually closes out with Jesus making a command to pray, to ask the Lord for something. 
But what I find fascinating about this passage is what Jesus prayed for. He didn't pray for anything for him. He didn't pray for anything for the disciples. He, he wasn't really worried about himself at all, actually. He prayed that they would have more workers. That's what he prayed for. A lot of times, and this is my sin, I'll pray for fruit. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus didn't pray for fruits. Jesus saw the fruit and he prayed for hard work. Right? That's what Jesus prayed for. And so it's not a matter of whether or not there's people that want to have a relationship with God. It's a matter of are there enough disciples who are willing to share their faith with enough people to save the souls that are out there. Right? And so that's really what we got to pray for. And this should change our perspective on prayer. Now, we know this, right? Like, this is actually something that's known in the world. JFK has a famous quote. He said, don't pray for an easy life. Pray to be a stronger man. Yeah. It's not about easy. There is no easy. Easy right. doesn't exist in life. It doesn't Come exist on. as a non-Christian. It doesn't exist as a Christian. Come on. There is no easy. It's just about hard work. Come and if you have a relationship with God, you're fired up when you work hard. Come on. Because God fulfills you. He gives you purpose. Come and that's on. why as a disciple, when I'm going through hard times, I'm smiling. I literally am. It brings me joy. It really does. James 1, consider it pure joy. Because when the pain comes, you know it's game time. Yeah. It's time to do some work. Amen. And that's why the pain comes, to help spur us on as disciples. Come on. We can't be sentimental, right? Yeah. There's a Christian world that literally preaches Christianity is not about work. Wow. It's all about work. <laughs> Jesus was all about work. Yeah. It's hard work. It's hand of the plow. It's not looking back. It's only looking forward. Come on. Yeah. Come on. But the world doesn't want you to believe that. It wants you to buy into a false Christianity wow. so that 600,000 people in Boston won't be shared with. Wow. Come on. But are we willing to do the hard work? Come on. You know, this is really what it's all Come about. On, yeah. What do we pray for? Pray to be harder workers. Come on. Pray to put our hands to the plow. You know, this is true love, too. This is that whole phrase, the labor of love, right? Love is put into action through hard work. You show your commitment. It's not a feeling. And that's the lie of the religious world, too. Love for God is not a feeling. It's putting it into action for the benefit of other people. Yeah. Hosea chapter 10. Come on. So go back to Hosea here. Hosea 10 verse 12. And I want to read one more passage from Hosea. It says, sow righteousness for yourselves, reap the fruit of unfailing love, and break up your unplowed ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. We'll stop right there. What is it saying here in Hosea? It's saying, okay, number one, we have to have an unfailing love, not a love like the morning mist, like you read about earlier in Hosea. An unfailing love, and we have to break up the unplowed ground. The unplowed ground of our own hearts. Right. So the things in our hearts that we need to break up so that we can give our whole heart to God. And then the unplowed ground of the hearts of the citizens of Massachusetts and New Hampshire. We have to break it up. And that's what happens when you get into a Bible study. Anybody who's been into a Bible study with disciples, there's some plowing, some even in a D time. Right. You got to start plowing, you know, and that's why people don't like being disciples. But you got to love it. You got to love the plowing of the hearts and doing the hard work of plowing the hearts of other people. And so this is what it's all about right here. You know, I want to lift up the campus ministry because this is really what we're going after. I mean, there's only six undergraduate disciples in the Boston church. And the charge is to share with 10,000 students before the end of the year. Come on. And that's what we're going to be going after. So six disciples are going to share with 10,000 students. Come why? On. Because we have to. That's why. Yep. And so we're going to do it. And it's going to be hard work and we're going to have to rely on God. Yeah. And yeah. I was thinking, I was like, man, we got to do some radical stuff here. And we could do the two week campaign where we share with like, you know, a thousand people in a couple weeks or whatever. But it doesn't really matter what happens in the two weeks. If after those two weeks are up, right. we don't share with another 9,000. Yeah. Right. yeah. You know what I mean? And so we came up with a campaign that's really just about sharing our faith every day and being radical on campus so that we can save souls. And we're breaking up the unplowed ground, the unplowed ground in our own hearts and the unplowed ground at Boston University, because there's a lot of people who still need to hear the word of God. Amen. That's the campus ministry. I want to ask the singles, what are you going to do before the end of the year? I want to ask you married people, what are you going to do before the end of the year? Are you going to have unfailing love for the lost before 2020? 
It's, a, it's almost 2020. Wow. It's a, at the end of a decade. I mean, in all the movies in 2020, it's flying cars. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't even have that. We still have Teslas and... Well, I'm a campus minister, and I'm going to be working hard on campus, but I'm also married, and I have a kid, and I want to have another kid. That's not going to stop me from going to campus. Yeah. I'm going to be on campus every day from 9 to 5. Amen. Then I'm going to go have dinner, and I'm going to play with Ethan, and then I'm going to go back to campus Come at 7 o'clock, and I'm going to be on campus until I get tired, and then I go to bed. Come on, brother. And then I'm going to wake up, and I'm going to do that again. What? Every day, Monday through on, Friday. Come and I'm on. married, and I have a family. Come on, Aaron. What are you going to do for the Lord? Come on. Where is your love for God and the lost? You know, people ask us why we do this stuff. I'll tell you what, I don't do it for the money. Yeah. Although people accuse me of doing it for the money. <laughs> it's really funny, actually, there's a guy online persecuting me right now, and he says that I'm doing this for the money. <laughs> Clearly, he has no idea who I am. <laughs> <laughs> I could easily be making three, four times as much what I make off of your contribution. <laughs> I'm not doing this for the money. Yeah. We don't do this for the money. We do this because we love God Amen. and we love to save souls. Amen. Go to Luke chapter 9, verse 57. Come on, bro. Come on. Come on. Come on, bro. This is awesome. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. Now, the theme passage was there in verse 62. But here's what happens before verse 62. Verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Mm. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Mm. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. Mm. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. We'll stop right there. Come on. It's not time to be sentimental. Yeah. Come on. That's what Jesus is saying. It's not time to worry about yourself. That's what Jesus is saying. Right. It's time to put your hand to the plow. Amen. And if you're going to put your hand to the plow, before you do it, you need to make a decision that when your hand goes on the plow, you're not going to look backwards. Come on. Come on. You're only going to look forwards. And Come Jesus on. says, if you do that, then you can change the world. Come on. But if you don't do that, then we're not going to make an impact. We're not going to make the difference that we want to see made in this world. Come on. And so that's what it's about. Who cares what happened last year? Yeah. I honestly don't care. Right. Yeah. We've got 50 sold out disciples and we can plow. Yeah, right. And so what do we got to do? We got to start plowing. Come on. Come on. Does it matter what the fallaways are doing? No. no. Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. Wow. That's on. what Jesus says. Come on. Forget about the fallaways. Go plow. Go find some people who want to love God and baptize them. That's the only way to save the world. It doesn't matter what the naysayers say. It doesn't matter what the persecutors say. It doesn't matter. You don't have to say goodbye to anybody. Put your hand to the plow and start plowing. And let's go save Boston. You know, time is a luxury that the lost have yeah. that we don't. Oh boy. Right? Yeah. Right. So we don't have time. Come on, bro. We just have prayer and we have plowing. Wow. Come and we on. gotta get to work for the Lord. Love it. You know, my challenge here for point number two is to pray, but it's also to go be fruitful. Yeah. Come on. It's to really go out there and baptize. Yeah. Come on, bro. And we've had some great victories. I mean, we've seen some baptisms recently. There's even a baptism that we didn't actually get to see here in Boston, but it happened uh, in Washington, D.C., yeah. where there's a sister, our now sister, Lauren, who was baptized from Northeastern, yeah. who left for the summer. Charmaine stayed in there with her. Yeah. She ended up going to the D.C. church before she comes back for school, and she just got baptized. Yeah. And so we're, we just had another baptism that's Come about on. to rejoin our fellowship here. Come on. So there are open people, yeah. but right. we need to put our hands to the plow and not look back. Amen. Amen. And so this is what it's about, church. And I, I really want to encourage you guys. It is time to turn. Yeah. It is time to turn the corner. 
But there's only one way to do it. It's to be faithful. It's to plow in prayer and in the plow for people. Amen. To God be the glory.